It's good morning. I want to welcome you here to worship. As we uh, move into this time, let's take a moment to listen to the music and let it transport our souls into a time of praise for God. Good morning. morning. I want to welcome you here. There are a lot of things going on, so as always, it's best to look through this bulletin or get on our mailing list for weekly updates and and, uh, newsletters uh, so that you can get the full details. Uh, But I want to highlight a few things real quick as we get started today. Uh, One of them is that today, after our service, first of all, there's going to be some wonderful refreshments downstairs. We hope you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, But then our our youth group is going to be meeting, and it's great to get that group going again. And then a little bit after that, at 1230, uh, outside, got the wonderful area out there now, uh, we're going to have our Blessing of the Animals service. And uh, this is something that um, you can come to be a part of other animals being blessed. You can come with your animals. You can come with pictures of animals or stuffed animals. Uh, there's really no limitation. Uh, some of the folks who are very observant this morning saw that I was doing my best fashion-wise. I've got my Peruvian you know, shepherds here, and I've got my lizards on my tie. I'm, I was trying to find anything I could to kind of connect to this because it's an awesome, uh, awesome time. So it's a brief service outside. If you're interested, please join us. Um, It's it's a lot of fun. When we move on from that, there are some other pieces going on as well. One is that the food and the items that have been collected here are going to make their way over to Gifts of Love next to be used. And on this third Sunday, Food Basket Sunday, we love to highlight that. We love to have them be a part of our worship so that we can bless them as part of the gifts that this church is sharing with others, even though this is something that goes on all month long. Um, So it's fun to be able to see that that work that's taking place. Also, as we move forward into the future, one of the things that's coming up is Lunch Bunch, and uh, that's on October 26th. There's information here in your bulletins, and so we want to make sure you get that on the calendar if you are someone who has availability during the day to do that. And this week, there are some gatherings. Both of our Soul Sisters book groups, the daytime group and the evening group, are going to be meeting this week. And so uh, there's information here. You, if you've never gone before and you're curious, you can jump into one of these. Uh, uh, just contact the contact person. And uh, you don't have to have read the book to be able to be a part of it and see what it's like and see if that's something that would be a lot of fun. Because frankly, I think if you do it, that's what you're going to discover. Uh, the, the last piece I'm going to share, and then I'll ask if there's others, 
is uh, our, our evening Bible study group uh, has uh, made a decision as to where it's proceeding next. Uh, we just finished looking at the Gospel of Matthew, and um, so we've decided to do the very easy Book of Revelation. So uh, the Book of Revelation is our next stop. Uh, if that's something you uh, have heard about but you have no idea what's in there or you've read it and you still have no idea what's in there, uh, this is going to be an opportunity to learn about it. Um, so that's one group and we're also in the process of forming another group. We'll share some details about that uh, to explore one of Richard Rohr's uh, most famous books. So all those things are taking place. Are there other announcements or news that I've missed here? Um, yes, so it's very helpful, folks. Uh, we have those pew pads that are located in each pew um, and, and it's something, we're not, we're not taking attendance, uh, but it's nice to know who's around and also then to, to be sure of who's not here so we can check in on them. It's also a great way to let us know if you're visiting, you want to share your information or you'd like to be contacted. Uh, so it's a good thing to get back in the habit of doing. Uh, so if you grab those, pass them down to folks there in your pew. Also, uh, as always, we have those yellow index cards in your pews and those are meant to be for prayer requests later on. So if there are joys or concerns that you'd like to have lifted aloud during the service, you can write on those, and when the offering plates come around, you can put that in the offering plate, and we'll share that as part of our, our worship a little bit later on. Other announcements or news to highlight for folks? Okay. If not, then let's take another moment here just to center ourselves as our choir welcomes us into worship. If you're comfortable doing so, I want to invite you to rise now and welcome one another to worship. You can wave, you can shake hands, you can bump elbows, you can introduce yourselves, but greet one another in the name of Christ. And the other thing we like to do is to know that we have folks who are worshiping with us at a distance. So if you have, turn around here and just wave at the cameras to welcome folks to worship uh, and, and to be a part of that. <laughs> Our choir is active. Very good. So now what I'd like you to do is to grab your bulletins and you'll find our call to worship. And if you're comfortable standing, then remain standing. If not, that's fine. Um, but let's, let's share this as we get started. We gather here to worship seeking a focus for our being. God calls us to worship the word made flesh. We gather here to worship though we feel drawn in too many directions, overwhelmed with too many tasks, chasing after something we can't quite name. God calls us to worship leaning into the spirit of truth. We gather here to worship wondering and hoping, doubting and uncertain, frustrated and afraid, but we are here. God calls us to worship with our whole selves. We are here. Let us worship with joy. Amen. And now if you'd grab those hymnals, the blue books, to number 518, you'll find this is a day of new beginnings. And join in singing with me if you would.
Thank you so much. Please be seated if you would. We have something very fun to do today, and uh, that is to welcome folks into the membership and the fellowship of this church. Uh, next week, we'll have time for baptism for two individuals, so we are in a, a season right now of some really fun things that are always good to be a part of. Um, I want to invite up our, our folks who've made this decision right now so they can join with us in making a commitment. So I want to have uh, Tom Gillette come on up, uh, Elaine Gagney, uh, Eric and Shannon Panetta, and Barb Upton and Suzanne Rogers. If you all would come on up here and get in the line right here at the bottom of the steps. Okay. Do some of you remember when you did this? <laughs> it's always something like, wait, do we have to do that? <laughs> do we have to get up there? And they've been great. They're, they're, they're humoring me. Uh, they, they have been a part of our life, each one, uh, for some time now. And just as we've moved through pandemic and these times, they've been very patient uh, in waiting for this moment. And so today what that means is we're not saying, welcome brand new people who've not, not been here and know nothing about our church. These are folks who've been involved in our church in, in many different levels, um, and uh, we are recognizing this commitment that they've already made, and we're going to take a moment to go ahead and commit to going ahead and doing this journey with them, to offering the support and the Christian fellowship that we can offer as a church. So, friends in Christ, we are all received into the church through the sacrament of baptism, and these people have found nurture and support in the midst of the family of Christ. Through prayer and study, they've been led by the Holy Spirit to affirm their baptism and to claim in our presence their covenantal relationship with Christ and the members of the church. They are here for service to Jesus Christ, using the gifts which the Holy Spirit bestows. So I have these questions for you. Do you desire to affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I do. Do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, please say, I do. I do. do you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, please say, I do. I do. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. And do you promise according to the grace given you to grow in the Christian faith and to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all the world? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. Wonderful. Well, by your baptism, you were made one with us in the body of Christ, the Church. And today we rejoice in your pilgrimage of faith which has brought you to this time and place. We give thanks for every community of faith that has been your spiritual home, and we celebrate your presence in this household of faith. So do you accept the doctrine and covenant of this church and promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God, contributing your time, talent, and money to the ministry of the church, and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves this community and the world? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. Wonderful. Well, let us, the members of West Avon Congregational Church, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ. We, the members of this church, welcome you with joy into our communion and fellowship. We pledge to you our support, our help and prayers, that together we may increase our love of God and neighbor in Jesus Christ through caring, sharing, outreach, and worship. God grant that loving and being loved, blessing and being blessed, serving and being served, we may truly be the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I have for each of you a very official looking uh, certificate here to mark this day. And so, Elaine, here is yours. Yeah. Okay. Tom, there you go. You. Eric, there you go. Shannon, there you go. 
Suzanne, there you go. And Barb, there you go. What we want to do, I think, I hope, is congratulate them as, and this time in joining us. So can we go ahead and do that right now? Okay, so they are going to now sign the membership page from the membership book, make it official, and then our deacons will be the first to welcome them into fellowship here, but uh, downstairs afterwards, I hope folks will join in and have more of a chance to do that. While they're doing this, let's go ahead and, and, and greet them in song. So if you would turn and find the hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, uh, let's share that as they, as they do this right now. Folks, contained within this group that you have up here, you have uh, three folks who work in different ways with education. You've got um, someone who is the person to call if you want to transform your kitchen and some other spaces uh, and put wonderful countertops and other pieces of art in there. Uh, you've got a nurse. You have someone who's so good at numbers that she has agreed to be our next financial secretary here at the church, and we're very excited about that. Um, You've got a lot of folks with diverse talents, but also with some really cool stories about how they made their way here to be with us. And the best way to find that out is to talk with them and get to know them. Uh, so I hope you'll take advantage of that today and each day going forward, because um, that's part of the promise that we've made to each other today. What I'd like to do now is invite our young people, anybody who's school age, uh, who wants to head on out. There is Sunday school today, uh, so Mary's going to lead the charge uh, to head downstairs now, okay? And while that takes place, I want to invite us to join together in a moment of prayer. So if you would, join your heart with mine. God, we gather once again in a beautiful day, and we give thanks. We come here to worship you and to give praise, but we also come in the midst of a week that's been very difficult. And uh, we have mourned along with others, and we've called for comfort and solace, and we've tried to figure out how we can offer support so God, as we worship, help us not only to give thanks and praise, but help us to be open to your leadership for how we can minister in this world that needs it so badly. We pray all of these things even as we also join together now and ask the prayer that our Lord ta taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, part of gathering in worship and part of just even spending some time thinking about God and our relationship with God and others is always being mindful of the journey so far. And each one of us, we're very human. Uh, no doubt there have been times where that journey hasn't matched up to what it could have been, and what we dream of having. But instead of being stuck in the past, we seek healing. So we ask of God to go ahead and to repair any break or difficulty in our relationship with God or with others in the world so that we can move from shalom into the world that awaits us. I'd like to invite you then to join with me in doing that today. So we'll now have a, we'll now have a moment of confession. From the least of us to the greatest, Lord, we want to know you. We yearn to follow where you lead us. We need your guidance. But even as we listen for your direction, other voices compete for our attention with teachings that suit our desires. Our thoughts drift so far from your truth that fables and fancies begin to seem real. Holy One, open our hearts and minds. By your spirit, convince, rebuke, and encourage us as only you can. Teach, correct, and inspire us in the ways of your salvation. Amen. God has shared with us all that we need to know to understand and to receive salvation and this gift of forgiveness and grace and mercy. So let us open our hearts. Let us find within our hearts the love of God written there, always with us, that can never be taken away. Let us return to God, embracing, seeking to move forward together, working as a team. And where there is brokenness, where there is hurt, may we find healing and peace so that we can live every moment to the fullest that still lays before us. We pray this in God's holy name. Amen. Please listen to the word of God as it is recorded in the Bible. Our reading is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, 27 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know thy Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, 1 to 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray and always, to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, 
Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says and will not grant God and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? May God bless us to the reading and the hearing of this scripture. Let us praise God uh, for the word. Please be seated if you would. So after last week, I have, in this time, checked the bulletin about five times to make sure there's not a hymn right here uh, before the sermon. Uh, because last week we had a great hymn that was supposed to happen right before the sermon and I was in such a hurry to get things off my chest and share with you uh, that I just went blew right past it. So um, I share that with you uh, in part just because that's how my life I process these things but also to say I persisted. I'm back. I'm here this week even though I kind of you know tripped over myself last week and other weeks uh, I show persistence. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to get this right someday. Persistence is an yeah. <laughs> Persistence is an amazing quality sometimes in our lives, um, and uh, it's something that can also be funny when we think about it in life. Uh, Milton Berle, who was a comedian that some of you know uh, from many days in the past, uh, he was somebody who uh, had some great one-liners, and in one part where he was talking about persistence, he said, "How would the guy have felt if he quit after six up?" Oh, seven up? Come on, folks. Or the guy that stopped at preparation G. Okay, maybe that's a little bit more relatable. H, we want to have that one. So, okay, fine. Milton Berle's not your, your cup of tea. But there are other examples of persistence that are a, a part of our lives. And apart from just uh, needing to stick with it to get somewhere, all too often, the examples of persistence that we have are ones where people are persisting or doing their best to do so in seemingly impossible circumstances. Uh, I got addicted after the fact, after it was really on TV, to Brooklyn Nine-Nine, to a comedy show on television. And in that show, there's a, a police officer who is a very rules-bound person. She loves structure and rules and just thinks it's great. And so when she's uh, tasked with having a block party there in New York City, she does everything that's required of her. She fills out myriad forms after looking at all the instructions, and she is ready when she makes her way there to the permit office to get that permit for the block party. And when she makes it there, she proudly, even though the person is sure she won't have them, she proudly puts down each form saying what they are and how they're connected and how she's already got them all perfect. Everything is good. And she is just beaming in that moment until the person behind the desk informs her, well, there's just one problem. You see, that form that you have there, that needs to be authorized before you can submit this. And Amy's taken aback for a moment. She says, because... I can't get that form authorized until I submit this other form as part of this application. And the person said, yeah. And so Amy sat there for a moment, running it through in her brain, saying, I need this other form to be authorized to submit this form, but I can't do that until this form is authorized, which needs the other form to be authorized. And she just kind of kept going in a loop, and her friend finally dragged her away and said, see, she's in a loop, you broke her brain. And she kind of pulls her out of there. 
that's relatable on some level to folks and in fact was developed into kind of a much more famous premise when you go back to Joseph Heller's novel Catch-22 or maybe movies or other things you've seen based on it probably over the years. Catch-22 famously dealt with some of the inconsistencies that folks find in life and this time it was during World War II and it talked about these pilots who were flying mission after mission after mission and they would reach the number of missions they needed to go ahead and be taken off rotation and go home only to be told after they'd already done it that more missions would be required and the rules kept changing under their feet and it was very frustrating. Well at one point there is this effort to go ahead and say well what if we're, we're, we're just too, too uh, mixed up mentally to be up there flying, it's not safe, you know? What if we could be evaluated that way and that's how we could be taken off? And so in the novel, in chapter five, it says, there was only one catch, and that was catch 22, which specified that a concern for one's safety in the face of dangers that were real and immediate was the process of a rational mind. So, either the pilot was mentally, had mental difficulties and he could be grounded, but all he had to do was to ask and say he had them and therefore it wasn't safe and he should be grounded. And as soon as he did that, he would be recognizing there was a danger, which is the act of a rational mind. And so then he could not qualify for that and he would need to fly more missions. And around and around and around they went facing the frustration of something set up to stop them in their tracks. Now, if you liked MASH, you remember Klinger and his constant attempts to find a way around these very same difficulties. So we can laugh at these things until we're faced with them in moments that are life-changing. Jesus, in, in sharing this parable today, tries to set up that kind of a situation, has this person, these are imaginary people in his story, but has this woman, she's a widow, and she's come before the judge seeking justice, and we don't really have a lot of details about it, but we do know from Jesus' teachings and from what we know of that world that if you're a widow, it changes your, your place in life, and because it's a society where men are the ones who own property and make decisions and do all these other things, including making money, it puts you in a very vulnerable state. So here she is very vulnerable and she goes to this judge whose duty it is to go ahead and seek justice and to look after everybody. But in Jesus' story, we hear that this judge does not care, doesn't care about the people he's supposed to, doesn't care about or worry about what God's gonna do to him if he does something wrong. The judge does not care. But we hear in Jesus' parable that this widow comes and she comes and she will not be deterred and she keeps coming and she keeps asking and she keeps persevering until finally he is worn down and he responds and does what he should have done in the first place. It's a story that, think about all those other examples, we can relate to and we explore in our arts and we think about these situations because it's not foreign to a lot of people but it's important to know that this story comes on the heels of the earlier passage we heard just a short while ago, where Jesus is talking to those same disciples and he says, look, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell that tree to go flying off and it would do that. He offers that teaching not to shame them and say, well, you must not have any faith because you can't do that. Instead, as we discussed, what he tries to say to them is, you do have faith sufficient to do the impossible. You just don't think you do. He tries to help them to see it in a different way, even though we hear it as condemnation. Well, in today's parable, he's not turning around and presenting probably what we think on the surface. In fact, we get the message for today's parable contained right in our reading from the passage. We hear right at the beginning of the parable, here's what this parable means. And it says, Jesus is addressing the people and addressing their need to pray always and not to lose heart. So this message that we're about to hear at that point is to help people think about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. That's a good message. It may be where we were headed right away when we were hearing this passage, or maybe not. In truth, we know that in folks' prayer lives, both then and now, 
Prayer is not some easily contained subject to discuss or think about. That a lot of times people struggle when it comes to prayer because if we want to say, oh, I believe or I don't believe, well, okay, I believe in God and then I move through my life. But when you think about prayer, that's something entirely different because that means that not only do you believe in God, but you are going to go ahead and open yourself up and try to communicate with God. And that makes it much more concrete because then in your mind you have some idea, well, who is God and what is God about and why would I share this with God and what do I think will happen? It brings it into focus in a whole other way. And sometimes, sometimes we struggle with that. Sometimes, sometimes we have experiences that make us try to figure out how does prayer work? might pray over and over and over again for a situation dear and close to our heart and it doesn't seem on the surface to change the ways that we want it to and so then we take a step back and we begin to wonder and sometimes doubt. In some ways it reminds me of a Peanuts comic strip and if somebody just noticed my little Peanuts uh, book on my desk that I have there to amuse people when they're waiting for me. Well, There's one story where Lucy is trying to offer encouragement to Charlie Brown And she says, look at it this way, Charlie Brown. These are your bitter days. These are the days of your hardship and struggle. But if you just hold your head up high and keep on fighting, you'll triumph. And Charlie Brown responds and says, gee, do you really think so, Lucy? And as she walks away from him, Lucy says, frankly, no. People can become jaded and they can start to wonder, does prayer really work? And it's not working the way I thought it would and they can give up on it. Jesus speaks directly to that point in his parable today, but the problem is we get distracted. We get distracted because much like feeling like that mustard seed story is trying to tell us we don't have any faith at all, which it isn't. In this place, we hear the story about this widow who comes and tries and persists and perseveres, and there is this judge, this unjust judge that won't listen and won't respond, and then finally, finally responds. And we hear this, and we want so often to sit there and say, well, the judge in this story is God, and we're the widow. And you need to stop right there, because the judge in this story is never meant to, to be God. We get into trouble right away when we start thinking about it that way. We heard our passage from Jeremiah a little bit earlier. We've been journeying with Jeremiah and the people through a time where um, there he was trying to help them change their way and that wasn't happening and so then it came to pass that the Babylonian army came, took people away, a horrible dif- difficult situation and yet Jeremiah kept saying have hope because there will be a future. And then when the people made their way back, he continued to help to to guide and to share this word. And we hear now that they're back, this word today, where he says, look, you don't need to worry about things from the past determining what happens. Now it's on our shoulders. And he says, God's going to help us out. God who loves us isn't going to rely on us having to find the right person to teach us or find some book somewhere that's going to be read to us. God's going to write the covenant on our hearts. We're going to know deep down inside what God is, what God wants from us in our life. We're going to know... We'll feel it. That's the God that we're talking about. Or in Psalm 139, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. That's the God we're talking about. We're not talking about a God who is heartless and unjust and sits there intentionally ignoring us and not caring about us. That is not who we understand God to be. Instead, this judge is a character that Jesus uses in a story and uses to go ahead and help people understand that there is a a deep understanding of what it is to be in life where you face its seemingly unchangeable circumstances that are so difficult. And what do you need to get through that time? This is a message, as Jesus offers it, that is heard by Jews who are living in military occupation there in their own country. 
It's a message that later, when Luke records this gospel and shares it with others, it is years after the temple, the center of Jewish worship, has been destroyed. And it's also a time where people are looking around and saying, I thought this was all going to be over really quickly, but we're all still here for some reason. So they're stuck with these things that they are wrestling with. And Jesus is trying to help them to find, in the midst of that, a faith that lasts. Marcus Borg, when he talked about faith at one point, he said, faith is trusting in the buoyancy of God. Faith is trusting in the sea of being in which we live and move and have our being. I love this idea. Faith is trusting in the buoyancy of God. In those difficult times, it may seem that we're sinking. Faith is trusting in the buoyancy of God to help to see us through those things that we're dealing with. When Jesus speaks to those who will hear, Jesus seeks to help his hearers understand if this awful judge will finally respond to, prayer, or to, to the requests, how much more will God who loves and cares for you respond? So it's not about God being the judge, it's about how much more, when God is entirely different than that judge, will God respond to you when you open up your heart and when you share. That's powerful. But this passage ends with a whole different tone. At the very end, Jesus said, And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And you can almost hear the sadness as he ponders. You can also then look at this story that he made up to teach his point and you can maybe see why there's sadness, because it seems as he thinks about the world and how it is, he thinks about the difficulties that people are facing. So he thinks about a widow left adrift in society, and through her extraordinary bravery and determination, she can wash up against the walls of this judge who tries to stop her, and there can be hope in the midst of that, but it takes so much to get there. So he tries to speak to others who find their hope wavering as they try to find the ability to keep trying over and over again. He's sad that she had to do it in the first place, and we continue to feel that way over and over and over again when we think of those who had to continue to struggle and pay great price for civil rights right here in our own country. We think about women who went through horrible situations in trying to secure the ability to vote and be heard in this country, and this is just examples close to home, many more elsewhere people who needed to find ways to persist in the middle of great difficulty. But I wonder if there's not also sadness in Jesus' heart when he thinks about this judge and creates the story, because that judge, unfortunately, is not so different than so many of us. This judge who stops up their ears and turns up the volume so that they don't have to hear the cry of the widow and feel convicted about what to do and respond some way we know time and again that's something that happens, not just in a parable that's made up. There's an interesting interpretation that twists all of this around, and I don't think it's where Jesus was going at all, but Reverend Jonathan Chapman, a minister in our denomination, in thinking about this, talked about this passage and said, you know, you can even think about this in a whole other way. If you want to put God in that story, if you want to make God one of those folks, what if God is the widow in that story? So God is persistently calling, is persistently crying out and saying, this is what needs to happen. You need to wake up. You need to respond. You need to act on it. And we, we are the judge who continues to not listen. It's kind of a powerful way of hearing it. We can work on listening and responding and seeing each other the way we need to. We can work on not seeing people the way that the judge does. It is within our grasp. Jim Wallace, social activist, writer, speaker, all those things, he wrote about an experience he had once in a, a Sojourner's Neighborhood Center, and it, it's a place to feed people. It's a half a mile from the White House in Washington, D.C., and they, at the time, were feeding about 300 families per meal. 
And he talked about the wonderful kind of effort to, to, to do all that, but also that before they let folks in for the meal, they always took time for a moment of prayer. And when he was there, he experienced the person who always got picked to pray. Her name was Mary Glover, and she was 60 years old at the time when this happened. And he said, you know, when she's there, she, she's asked to do this, and she prays this prayer right before they feed everybody. She says, another day to serve you, Lord. Lord, we know that you'll be coming through this line today, so Lord, help us to treat you well. We can change and make sure that we're never the judge in that story. This story is not a story about having persistence and wearing God down into submission so God will finally love us or be concerned for us or be active in this world, sometimes in ways we don't understand. Instead, it can be a story that helps to give us purpose, helps us to think about our faith and our hope, helps us to realize that those are gifts that we need to embrace as we move forward. And perhaps when we talk about persistence, it's not so much about going against God and having God change God's mind. God is not that judge. But that judge represents the powers that be that resist and come up with catch-22s and prevent people from getting past them. And H. Jackson Brown, who is not the singer, Jackson Brown, once wrote, in the confrontation between the stream and the rock, the stream always wins, not through strength, but through persistence. Let our prayers be streams which beat upon the rock of evil. Not God. The judge. Amen. Folks, as we move towards service in the world, we take a moment to... Think about our lives and what God has done for us and to respond to that through our offering. And that can be through money we give today or at other times we want to think about today and bless. It's through these gifts we're going to share with gifts of love, among others that come in through the month. It's about thinking about our service and our talents and our abilities and how we can honor some of those same questions that we asked these folks when they became part of our church because those are the same questions that we have responded to and committed to. So let's take a moment and as we think and open our hearts... Let's pray to God to bless every single way that we can be an aid to others.
Dearest God, we ask that you'd bless all the gifts. Help us to find ways to share generously. Help us to find ways to have our actions speak to our faith, show to the world what we care about and what's important to us, and help us to find wisdom so that as we're doing that, we can make a difference in your name, that we can truly be your hands and your voice in this world. We pray all of this, asking your blessing and guidance in the name of Jesus who gathers us here. Amen. Thank you so much. If you'd please just be seated for a moment. Folks, I'd like to invite us all into a moment of prayer as we get ready to head into the world as disciples of Christ. So if you would join your heart with mine and feel free to lift any prayers, of course, that you have within your own heart. God, as we gather here today, we know that there are so many right now who have been calling upon you, your name, asking for help, trying to find a way to understand and to deal with the events of this past week. Our prayers go to the families of the police officers in Bristol who suffered that horrible tragedy and two of them having lost their lives. We ask God that you would be a comfort to those who worked beside them, who shared friendship and family and love. We ask that you be with all of those right now who find themselves grieving and struggling and trying to make sense. We ask that you be with families in Raleigh, North Carolina, who seek to get, again, to comfort one another and to find wisdom and to find support and a light to guide them through the days right now that are happening. We think about the folks in California that are coming to grips with the loss and understanding how the world has changed because of the actions of one person. God, we also know that beyond these moments, there continue to be so many in Ukraine that are dealing with tragedy. We know, God, that there are people who are still trying to begin to put the pieces together after the hurricane. God, in the midst of all of this, we pray, and we pray consistently, and we don't lose hope. We seek your faith that is buoyant in the middle of this world and this being that we exist in. We seek to find whatever help you can give us so that we, in turn, can turn around and help others with those gifts. So we open our hearts, we share our prayers for others, and we seek to find how we might be a blessing. As a community here, we ask that you be with those who are celebrating new additions, new family members, but also those who are continuing to ask for your healing. And today we would add prayers and praying for Joan who fell and broke her elbow. But we continue our prayers for, for Diane and and for Charles and Jerry, for Doug and for Betty Lou, among others. God, hear these prayers and respond in the ways that your wisdom guides you. Help us to be receptive to your presence and your spirit and the gifts it bestows. We ask all of these prayers and more that have been lifted within our hearts here during this time. We share them with you, trusting in you. We offer them knowing you love us, you accompany us, you are a part of our living, and you respond to our prayers. Amen. Folks, we're going to sing our closing hymn uh, and to move towards our, our, our mission in the world. So if you turn to 595, Be Thou My Vision, if you're comfortable doing so, please rise and let's share this together.
Yikes. All right, so a prayer for whatever just happened up there, but let's have a moment of blessing for a second. God, we ask that you would go with us from this place. Help us to move from worship to the service that awaits us in the world. Help us to find joy in the opportunity to make a difference and to help your kingdom shine through a little bit more each day. As we move forward, help us to be vessels of your love. Help us to share your light with a world that needs it badly. Help us to find a faith that persists in the, in the face of all that we see and even a faith that we might use as we seek to change this world that we have. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.